cotton, kidney disease, hypertension. Oh, and then he had a kidney transplant due to a congenital issue. Human-Wide is a pilot that we are conducting in a primary care clinic in Santa Clara. We at that clinic have also implemented a team-based care model, which we think is going to help us transform what we're doing in primary care. The focus of Human-Wide is to consider how can we leverage the best of the art and science of medicine that we have at Stanford and across the country and the world. Technology, genomics, uh, diagnostics, how do we leverage that so that we are uh, focusing on prevention and proactive care to prevent disease before it strikes. Human-Wide is our first step in the process of re-envisioning the primary care experience. Human-Wide is really an opportunity to be able to take a subset of patients and it allow us to be able to wrap our arms around these folks in a unique way. It's been said that the zip code is more important than genetic code, and that's a real strength of human-wide because some of the socioeconomic or environmental factors are just as important as the genetic factors, and that's why it's important that human-wide takes such a broad approach. With Human Wide, we're able to focus on the whole human, who they are when they're working, who they are when they're playing, who they are when they're at home. By getting such a detailed look at their genes, for example, or other biomarkers in their blood, and combining that with everything that's going on in their environment. Which means for us as providers that we want to watch you a little more closely so that we can prevent disease well ahead of time. When I was a medical student, all of medical knowledge doubled every seven years. It now doubles every 120 days. It's very hard for the physician of the future to be able to keep up with that rate of medical knowledge. A precision health approach um, that marries artificial intelligence with continuous monitoring and multiple uh, testing modalities like pharmacogenomics. I mean, this is the kind of information we need in the future to really take care of our patient and provide the best outcomes. This is the photograph of my dad's family side. This is my grandmother. She died at the age of 90. However, her husband, he died at the age of 60 with heart attack. My auntie baby, she died at the age of 80 with heart attack. My uncle Nonoy, he died at the age of somewhere in the 60s range as well of heart attack. My uncle Toto, he also died of basically complications of diabetes. Uncle Boy, he died of lung cancer. And then my dad, I don't think my dad reached age 60. I think he died probably at the age of late 50s. He died of basically complications of diabetes. The youngest one, my auntie Ninette, he also has diabetes and heart condition problems, so that's how they died. My brother, my sister, right, they all have high triglycerides just like me. My brother's higher like 600s. I'm like in the 400s. I think my sister's like on the 300s. My cousins on my father's side also have high triglycerides, like most of my cousins do. I had operations when I was three or four years old, and they end up removing one of my kidneys and part of another kidney. I lived for about 40 years with just the part of one kidney. It worked fine, but it was always told to me for at some point in time that you know I was going to either uh, have to go on dialysis or get a transplant. I went on uh, peritoneal dialysis in 2009. Uh, it was working okay, but uh, again, you spend eight hours a day, seven days a week on a machine every night. And dialysis is always just something temporary. Dialysis is not something permanent. So I'd gotten on the uh, kidney transplant list. You know, I wasn't certain how long I was actually going to have to stay on the list. On February 9th, 2010, uh, my father was a live donor and, we, and I received a kidney from him. The issue that I have is that when I'm lying down in bed, I can't breathe through my nose, uh, primarily because there's not enough room in the nasal passages and also because my nostrils collapse when I breathe in. The surgery that I'm going to have will um, create more space inside the nasal passages and will also strengthen the, um, the structure of the nostrils so that they don't collapse when I breathe. 
I take vitamin C, magnesium, vitamin D, and I take flaxseed oil. We're going to start with this. This is a pharmacogenomics testing kit. So for this pen, um, we're just going to collect some samples from your inner cheek. My mother had cancer almost 24 years back. She started as a breast cancer and she was only 38. But after 5 years again she got ovarian cancer. And then every 5 years it tend to repeat in some form or the other. Then she got this peritoneal cancer. Before real pain actually she could. I mean she went into coma and then she passed away. So it was in last September. My daughter got leukemia like when she was 10 years old. Almost 2 years back. It's like a high risk one, the chances of relapsing is more. So they did a bone marrow transplant. Now she's doing fine, perfectly fine. She started going to school this year and she's doing good in school. Very good, thank you. Great. You just ask that we recheck your blood pressure before you go, okay? All right. No, okay. Let's let's compare. See, I'm normal. So you haven't had problems at home previously? No. What I realize is all my readings are like high. Everyone at home. Most of my readings at home is high. Okay. Yeah, I think we're... Um, wow, just a matter of minutes? The conclusion is that both numbers are giving us a little bit high values. And so it's just something for us to just sort right. of uh, pay attention to regardless. Um, I'm not sure how high um, it is, but, um, but it's on the higher side. As I mentioned before, I used to eat more salt in my diet, mm -hmm. junk foods, etc. And now I eat less junk foods, but... Same. Yeah, but he here's... I don't know, maybe it's just my body, right? Um, I never had blood pressure problems before. Yet the blood pressure has gone up. Right. So um, even at the office visit here, I mean, are using our cuff. So it's not just your blood pressure cuff. Um, there is a risk of cardiovascular disease with high triglycerides, unfortunately. Right. But as you understand, we're not really clear on how to treat it beyond lifestyle. We're starting to eat healthier. Right, there's Filipino foods that, that, that are not healthy, but there's also a lot of Filipino dishes that are healthy. My family, you know, uh, we have like bad genes, right? Most of my family have heart strokes. Ours on the young age, we already have like triglycerides, high blood cholesterol, so that's why it motivates me to eat healthy, you know? While my auntie's here, my mom is also recovering from surgery, so we try to eat healthy food. At least starting to. When you're on dialysis or something like that and your future is so bleak looking and then all of a sudden you're free from it, something like this, there's so much joy and satisfaction in, in, in the freedom from being inhibited. So let's start with you and your own medical history. So you're 39 now, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Okay. And I saw in your medical record you have hypothyroid. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. Do you have any other medical conditions? Uh, me, myself, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like on your mom's side of the family, there's nobody else who's had breast cancer. Nobody immediate. But if you see my mm -hmm. grandmother's sister, two sisters has got cancer. Uh, okay. What kind of cancers? Like one was breast, one was in the like uh, colon cancer. So when we first learned about some of these cancer genes, what we actually learned about was something called BRCA1 and 2, which you've heard about. These are the most common examples of a gene that causes breast and ovarian cancer, and they do kind of go together. All of us have two copies of every single one of these genes. So mm -hmm. you have two copies of BRCA1, I do as well. You have two copies of BRCA2, I do as well. The way that these genes work is they're like your instruction book for how your body works. Mm -hmm. So almost like a cookbook. So you can imagine if you had a cookbook and someone made a major typo on a recipe, your recipe might not turn out how you would want it to, right? Maybe okay. you add twice as much milk as you're supposed to, mm -hmm. or um, leave out the eggs or something like that. Your end product is gonna be different. And genes work the same way. They tell our body how to make things and how to function. And so if a gene isn't working properly, that can increase your chance, for example, of cancer. Okay, mm -hmm. so what we're actually doing in these genetic tests is reading out every letter, almost like a spell checking program. Mm -hmm. If we see a difference from what we expect, then we look in a database and we see, is this a, a change that I know causes a risk for cancer. So your mom, having had breast cancer at less than 50 and ovarian cancer, the chance that she actually has a BRCA1 and 2 mutation is about 40%. So your chance that we're going to find something on this test is about 20%. And that your lifetime risk of breast cancer is around 30%. The other thing I'll just point out is that because both of these numbers are above 20%, mm -hmm. I will make a note in your medical record that you should probably be getting screened with the alternating breast MRIs and mammograms every six months. Okay. Just for caution's sake. Okay. 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 Regardless of these test results. Oh my goodness, you were amazing. Really? Yes, it was ten months since April. Where are we? We're in the middle of end of May? I don't even know what the date is. Maybe it's because of working too much. <laughs> are you working? Or are you yeah. exercising more and everything? Eating healthier. I know. Uh, exercising probably the same as last time. Over 92. But at least not that high. Yeah. It's borderline. I th my feeling is if we you continue to lose weight, watch your salt, and get some exercise, and we're going to see the trend go down. If not, and you're still kind of hovering up there with this borderline, I'm tempted to put you on a medication. That's where I am. That's what okay. I'm thinking. Right, so let's um, monitor your blood pressure if you can do it. Like for me, is it crazy to do that like twice a week? Is that, is no, that no, doable? No, no, it's doable. Met with him, still high. Uh -huh. Pressure is 132 over 92. Mm -hmm. Uh, but had lost 10 pounds since yeah. April, which is great. Yeah. He had changed his diet, yeah. under a lot of stress, um, okay. not sleeping. Mm -hmm. I told him to come uh, back in a month prior to him leaving. I'll probably put him on some hydrochlorothiazide yeah. because he's still, he's still running just, hot. So I even, I know, I know. Now whether this is a new diagnosis this is for all him. new and he's yeah. pretty diabetic. We've got the family history. So okay. I'm like, we need to, yeah. it's time. Hello? Hey mom, how you doing? I'm good, and how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. I haven't got to talk to you in a few days. Well, the one thing that I always ask you is, how is your dad's kidney doing? <laughs> oh, everything's going, everything's going well, Mom. Everything's going well. My blood pressure's good. My weight's good. He said you got his good kidney. Yeah, I'm blessed. I really am. Yeah, I'm glad that you're doing good. The function of my transplanted kidney is very dependent upon controlling my blood pressure. Uh, and so I need to always make sure that my, my numbers stay in a relatively safe range so that I know it's going to extend my, uh, the viability of my transplanted organ. 
Human White has um, had a big impact on me because when I take my blood pressure now, this automatically talks to the app. The app then automatically forwards the information to my doctor at Stanford. The ability to predict and prevent is important. I want to maintain my life and uh, I need to know what's going on with my body so I can take uh, proactive measures, not just reactive measures. Me reactive measures are fine and always necessary, but if you take enough proactive measures, you don't need as many reactive measures. Nice to see you. You too. I'm Dr. Altman. I'm Welcome Debbie. to the Pharmacogenomics Clinic. Thank you. In this clinic, though, we're focusing on your response to drug, and we've learned that we can find uh, di small differences in the DNA that might make you, for example, metabolize a drug more quickly and get rid of it, so it's not actually in your bloodstream as long as it might be for somebody else. Or it might work better for you than for other people because of a little difference in your DNA. Well, specifically, I'm concerned about narcotic pain medications because I'm going to be having surgery and the surgeon has strongly recommended that I take narcotic pain meds after my surgery for the pain. Have you had bad experiences previously? Primarily, uh, I get really dizzy and um, disoriented, sort of drunk and, you know, high. Wow. and um, I don't have any pain relief, so I just feel awful. That's even worse. Yeah. So you're getting all the side effects, but not any of the right. benefits. And then I itch. I itch terribly wow. all over my Very everything. Common. There might be even drugs that have not even been released on the market yet that will be impacted by some of these genetic differences, and so it would be useful even going into the future to know uh, about your status for some of these, um, for some of these enzymes. So the first one that I'm going to highlight is this enzyme CYP2D6. So you're a slow metabolizer for this enzyme, but the important thing is that this enzyme is responsible for metabolizing like 50 or 100 drugs, mm. which means right off the bat, there are 50 or 100 drugs that I might recommend you get a lower dose of or less frequently, okay. including some of these opioid narcotics that you were talking about. I think that there are, what we'll recommend is uh, opioid medications that don't get metabolized by this enzyme, so it's totally taken off the table. My mother got cancer when I was only 15 years old. She survived for 24 years. For me, having Stanford and like you know good medical facilities here, I I don't really worry about cancer like you know something which will kill me or something soon. But the treatment definitely like you know I feel it is very tough. And even my daughter survived and I could see her like, you know, happy, dancing. Still, like, you know, when you hear or you, when I'm waiting for the result, I am actually like a you know, little nervous. So there will be some period where like, you know, I have to face it. See, now I am like going to be 39, 40. So my mother got it when she was 38. So now I could feel that pain like, you know, when you know, like her hair was gone, how difficult it was. Even same thing for my daughter. Like, she used to love her hair. I am not bothered about my hair or anything, but she used to love her hair. And when they lose that, it is difficult. Her cancer kept on repeating. Like, you know, she will be fine for five, six years. And then... Hello, I'm Jaycee here. Hi, this is Dr. Pauly. I've been calling from Stanford. Is this a good uh, moment? Yeah, sure. I wanted to go over the results of the genetic testing that you did a few weeks ago. Yeah, okay. Um, so, good news. I wanted to let you know, first of all, that you are negative for BRCA1 and 2, which is wonderful news, given your family history. Okay, thank you, Dr. Drew. That's a great news. Great. And we've also uh, checked for many other uh, mutations, um, and they were all negative. You know, I'm thinking about how you really have taken to this, um, you know, this precision health pilot, a human wine, very well. And I'm thinking about it, my dad's done this, you know, great thing for me. How can I not 
do everything possible to take the best care of myself. And um, so when this program came along, it just like it made sense because, okay, you're going to let me monitor my blood sugar, my blood pressure, my weight. Right. It's all integrated with technology. It just made sense. Mm. But hopefully there won't be any surprises. Right in this area, yes. you know, the, the surprise will come from somewhere else. That's you know, right, but, yeah, and that's what we're doing is we're trying to look for surprises. Now we know that your genetic screen is negative, so everything is great, and then, you know, we, we've been doing the pharmacogenomics tests and that was reassuring. Everything has just come up reassuring, yeah. and now we know from this point on that we're gonna have uh, a good sense of your blood pressures going forward, your healthcare team is going to be there to respond, in case of a surprise, okay? Yeah. So if there is a surprise, we're ready for it. It's not a good surprise. Yeah. It's sort of, yeah. we're prepared. That One of the hardest system. things is my dad was in, uh, you know, they tested us for every possible known thing. Of course. And he was in great health. Ah. And it was just hard to come to the realization four years later, he's diagnosed with stage three or stage four esophageal cancer. It was less than a year after he was diagnosed and he passed away. Mm. And that one's a tough one too, because yeah, you know. To, I just wanted him to do, um, like, try to find a way to get a cure for it or get it. To, mm. uh, he was was content to just allow the Lord to take him. Today is day five, Tuesday. My surgery was on Friday. I'm not feeling very much pain right now and I didn't have any of the foggy headedness that I considered a negative side effect. Welcome everyone to the clinical advisory meeting. I'll just present a case that hopefully will tee up the second section of the um, of our discussion on digital health. So this is a 43-year-old uh, Filipino man with multiple cardiovascular risk factors, including high triglycerides and multiple male family members who have severe coronary artery disease. And um, in the human-wide ambulatory blood pressure cough, the one that he just got through the, the pilot, uh, detected intermittent high blood pressures that were 145 to 160 over 90 or over 100. However, in clinic, he always had normal blood pressures. It was interesting. We hadn't, it wasn't, we weren't able to find one single uh, elevated blood pressure in his uh, in-office measurements. But later, this was verified with a more formal 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure assessment, and um, and then that um, helped us diagnose mass hypertension, which then obviously addressed his concern, which was primarily around his own risk for cardiovascular disease given his family history. So, um, so that gives you a sense of maybe some of the benefits of the digital health component. study opens a lot of new thinking, right, in terms of approach as to how you detect problems. I like the fact that they're doing it systematically, not just guessing. 
what motivates me about this program is I see the results real time. That keeps me motivated in terms of improving my health and my lifestyle. I want to be able to see my my granddaughters and them also seeing me, you know, to see a granddad. Human Wide is the opportunity for us to focus on what matters to a patient, craft the entire care plan around their goal. The initial participants in Human Wide are excited to be engaged in a study that first is going to enable them to understand their health and their well being much better, but also the information gathered from them in this study will enable us to design approaches to primary care that will benefit, we believe, hundreds and then thousands of other people down the road. Human Y represents the beginning of a movement 